My wife said Ooh. she or somebody else played Red Red Wine on their high school jukebox. It was that or we didn't start the fire. And oh. I said, which got played more? He said Red Red Wine. I have three uh, sisters and one of them, I, two of them I have a great relationship with. One of them is a very acrimonious. We, we don't talk. all. And so what I was going to ask you guys is having sort of family members or closely connected people in the band. Does that, do you feel like you can trust those people more or, you know, lean on them? Do you feel like there's more loyalty within the band or is it the opposite, sort of what he's saying? Well, the thing is, um, we was all friends before the band. We actually went to school together, secondary school, which is mm -hmm. from like 11 years old to, till you're 16. Yeah, like high so school. So we was all, we was all friends anyway, see, and then we formed the band later once we'd left school and we'd worked for a couple of years doing different jobs. And then we found ourselves, um, you know, unemployed on the doll, which is where the name comes they don't from. Come from that, the UB40, UB40, right? Unemployment card, yeah. So um, unemployment benefits, yeah, UB. unemployment ben ben you know benefit card. Mm -hmm. And it was um, it was a time of the punk era, yeah. so everybody was in a band. Everybody was trying to you know do a thing because like you know obviously the punk thing was yeah, like, sure. a bit thrashy in that. You know what I mean? Although I love the Sex Pistols, and they got a lot of stick at the time for being like not. Lot, really lot musicians, mm -hmm. but I think they've, they've done some great records. We've had a, one of the Sex right? Pistols you know? in here not that long ago. It was yeah, yeah. Cool. Glenn was in here not that long yeah. ago. It's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah. And you guys were were somewhat adjacent to, or at least following up on that whole two tone movement that was happening in the UK at the time, right? Yeah. Well, we was asked to actually join the two tone label. It's a record label that did bands like mm. the Specials and stuff like that yeah, that were yeah. introducing the idea of mm. different cultures music to UK, right? Yeah. So um, they they kind of came out before us. We used to go and actually watch them as we were getting our you know getting our shit together as a band, and um, but they were like ska and we were reggae. We were like more obviously like kind of Bob Marley kind of style, you know what I mean? Kind of reggae, yeah. and they were ska. So we didn't we didn't join the label. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, we went on some. You yeah, know, you were more the reggae style. They're more ska. Yeah. I like that. I just noticed that you actually did bring condoms. It's sex, drugs, oh, and okay. rock and roll. I like that. Oh. Can we all try them on at some point during <laughs> yeah, the show? I hope so. Well, maybe not on our penises. And there's only three, so oh, two right. of us are going to have to share. Someone's going to lose that. So, <laughs> um, so you guys considered yourselves from the get-go more reggae? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what we really loved. But, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't play. We actually, like most of us, had to learn to play, play an instrument. Like I, say, like I said, it was like the punk era. I don't so, know if you guys drink, by the way, but if yeah. you want some champagne. Oh, yeah, fake. there was a bit of leeway in, in plastic like, cups. Yeah, there was a bit of leeway in like you know actually like musicality and you know the technique of playing. We kind of learned that as we uh, you know as we progressed. Uh, well, you know, let, let's talk career. about that because that where did like because for also at the time I don't know enough about the history of what was going on in the UK at the time, but the fact that you guys were bringing in different races and different religion like different sensibilities. That really wasn't done back then, right? It had to be, just being honest, being that you're a black dude in a mostly white mm. band, there had to be some people being like, like we just had Fishbone on a couple mm. days ago, right? Mm. And they would get a lot of push, pushback as a black rock band just because yeah. they're, you know, not a rock band. Mm. They were a black rock band. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel shit like that? I mean, it's 1978. Do you drink? No, no I'm, okay. I'm okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, well, yeah, it was that era of um, like, you know, there was like fascists on, on the street, cheers, Margaret cheers, Thatcher. Yeah. Cheers to you. you know, cheers, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Let's do another one because it's your first um, podcast. <laughs> yeah, so it was all kind of that kind of, um, that kind of time where, um, you know, we would go out on demonstrations, you know, to stop the National Front mm. kind of marching and all that stuff. So we, we kind of came out of that, that whole thing. And like I said, we went to school together. And Birmingham is a kind of multicultural right. city anyway. So, you know what I mean? It was like, it wasn't like a really a big thing. It's just the way it happened, you know. And once you guys formed UB40, um, you did like a year of gigs, right? And Chrissy Hine, Pretenders, was really almost like the band's ambassador and helped you guys. She, I think she even took you out on the first tour, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd done like a small tour of um, around... Um, London pubs, basically, you know, like little gigs. Chrissy Irons was in the audience, and she basically took us on tour 
Uh, she was like the number one artist in the world, number one albums, right. singles, etc. So by the end of that tour, we had the, we had a hit record, you know, and uh, yeah, the rest is and Earl, we just carried you, on making records. After you did that tour with Chrissy, was it, isn't it right that you then booked the same arenas to say the, straight yeah, afterwards? Really? Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah, wow, wow, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fucking cool as yeah. shit. Exactly, yeah. just straight Obviously, up there, you know. Yeah, we wow. love Chrissy. You know, yeah, right? I mean I'm Chrissy. Sure she's also, you did. I got you, babe, with her. Which mm-hmm. there's a. Debate, maybe you can settle the debate on who actually's <laughs> idea it was to do I Got You, Babe. Because she oh. says it's her idea. Some of the guys in UB40 said it was their idea. I want to say right off the bat, it was your idea? I <laughs> trust UB40. Yeah. Hey, Chrissy Hine is known to be a lying bitch. I've heard that. Well, yeah. I think that's, that's only because you heard it from her. Yeah. Yeah. I, f- I, f- I think she did. It was her? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think she did, actually. But that's wild. So the, you're a year of gigs with her, and then you're a fucking headlining band. Yeah, yeah it was like, and um, you know, we could hardly play, because basically the first um, the album was the first compositions we wrote, mm-hmm. and we had to learn to play at the same time. So... It was kind of like learning in, in the spotlight, if you like. But mm-hmm. uh, we managed to get through it, and we've been touring and making records ever since. And the fact that, I mean, for the most part, except for when the original guy stepped down, it's basically, I mean, you bring in other musicians, but it was the four guys forever. That's wild to me. Yeah, well, it was originally eight, eight, yeah. eight of us, Yeah, you know. And there was actually a ninth, a ninth member, a guy who now lives in the, in the States. Uh, and then you saw the first check and you said, let's make it four guys? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the thing, see. We've always shared equally all the, all the publishing and everything. Anything we earn, um, mm-hmm. we split equally, see. And that was always the premise. And the so um, to go to the, obviously, the biggest single that you guys ever had, at least in this country, is Red Red Wine, right? Mm. And while we were eating, I told him, which I didn't know this, technically, yeah, I didn't know this at all. it's a Neil Diamond song, but not really... Because he found it somewhere, bought the rights to it, and owns it. You, it was never a hit for him. So you guys mm. made way more fucking money for him yeah. than he ever made from that song. Yeah. And never yeah. once did Mr. Diamond say, thanks, dudes. Well, he did kind of. <laughs> Which he is how he would have said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he took Thanks the piss dude. out of us when he'd done Birmingham. He performed Birmingham. it live as well, yeah, didn't and he? Yeah, um, yeah. he'd done like a big arena, our local arena. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he, he t- he'd done something like... Um, he he done like the rap part of the tune. Oh, he like, did really, and, and said thank you for like you know earning him so much money. Basically, oh, you know right. what I mean. Like yeah. so, he did kind of thank you. You know, it's funny. A, way, a girl that I uh, used to be used to date. Her best one of her best friends married Neil Diamond. They're married now. Right. Forget her name, but it's her last name is McNeil, right? So her name is Stacy McNeil, I think. And she married Neil Diamond, so her real name is Stacy McNeil Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a very yeah, unsuccessful yeah. McDonald's sandwich. <laughs> it just did not work out. Yeah. yeah, you know, red red wine was was right when I my wife said that she wanted me to pass on the senior year of high school every single day. Ooh. She or somebody else played red red wine on their high school jukebox, and it was that or. Um, she said, uh, it was that or we didn't start the fire. Oh. And I said, which got played more? He said, Red Red Wine. Yeah, of course. Without a doubt. Yeah. And so it's interesting because, and I wanted to ask you guys this, was that if you c- could have picked one song that sort of had the success that Red Red Wine, would it have been Red Red Wine? I'm always interested in that. That I think Like meaning I've met going people, into that album. Well, I mean, just yeah. I've met people that say, yeah, that was the song that I wanted to reach that mm-hmm. those heights. And I've met other people that say, actually, I think this song is much better. And I, we all thought that it was going to be much more successful than our sort of hit single. Where, mm-hmm. where do you where do you land on that? Where are the two? Well, you know? well, basically, um, the whole um, the whole reason we've done Red Red Wine was to show our uh, our influences as a band, right? Which so, hilarious because it was the Tony yeah, Tribe version, exactly, mm-hmm. not yeah. the Neil Diamond version, yeah, which was a so radio like, version. Yeah. So like that that whole album was hits. Every 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 record on every you know track on that album was a hit in the reggae charts at yeah, the time. Yeah, 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 that's right. So they were they were all hits to us. Mm-hmm. So like Red Red Wine was just another hit that he was doing. So it wasn't contrived or anything, but it kind of stood out once we'd done all the tunes. That red red wine was, you know, when you heard a it, you're single. like, oh, this is going to be the yeah. single. But you never know, Sue. When you start recording, you never know. You never go, right. you know, that's going to be a hit, and that's going to be a hit. And you by just, the way, this shows yeah. the difference of of radio going back then. Is that I think originally when it was released, they edited out the like rappy part because yeah. it was too wild for Ooh. radio. And mm. then they put it in, and it became a hit again a second time. So it shows right, you, yeah. it just crazy. Like you're confused <laughs> by that, TJ, right? It's wild yeah. that that, which is barely, it's a rap <laughs> is, and it's like, oh, that's too aggressive 
for radio. So I, re- I remember that. That's it's, wild. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. that's absolutely wild. But it, you know, and these things become. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's the, the reggae charts in my world, in my wife's world. She's in you know rural Michigan. I'm from Denver, Colorado. In our big world, reggae community that in was rural huge Michigan. Huge <laughs> reggae, rural reggae was the actual uh, that was the name the of the club. genre. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it the, you know in our worlds that seemed to reach us and just become ubiquitous. I mean, it was just mm. everywhere during that time and then afterwards. And I just think that the other incredible thing is that that was the, o- and I'm not joking when I say this, the only reggae song that mm. she heard right. or came into her world. Because yeah, there, Bob Marley would be too dangerous for rural yeah. Michigan. Well, 100%. And yeah. then that really wasn't, nobody's parents were really right. listening. It just was so mm. out there. And in that way, UB40 kind of... They bridged the gap, right? Yeah, they bridged the gap. Yeah. And you Definitely. brought that, even the idea that hadn't crossed their minds or they... Uh, that reggae was something that maybe they should explore and get more into. I want to really quick, before I forget, UB45, great name for the tour, for the all of it. Did you do a UB41, UB42? (laughs) No, I don't think they did. It's a genius, isn't it? (laughs) It took us ages to think of that one. uh. All right, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. The button's here somewhere. I don't know where. Over there, there, there. Just subscribe, and thanks for watching to the end of the STR show. Go to Gas Digital if you want, gasdigital.com, the STRshow.com. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you.